Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody. Once again, this is number four, right? And uh, for those of you here in the studio, thanks for coming in and uh, one more program and we'll be on our way home. For those of you out in television, again, we just want to thank you for your letters, your prayers, your support, everything. And uh, I guess the best way I can put it, we're just a simple Bible study. We, we don't try to build an empire. I have no intentions of building a college <laughs> or doing anything like that. We're just going to keep on teaching the Word and let other people do the other things. So anyway, all we want to do is teach the book and show people how to study on their own. This is the name of the game. Don't go by what Les Feldick says or anybody else says. Learn to search the Scriptures and uh, determine what is for us today. Okay, now is chapter 5 of 1 John, verse 1. We have another repeat of what we've been seeing all the way through this little epistle and how that it is tied to Christ's earthly ministry has nothing to do with the death, burial, and resurrection, which we're going to look at now in just a little bit. But here is another repeat of the kingdom message. Because you want to remember, uh, oh, I was going to put it on the board. Have I got room? Can they get it on the camera, I wonder? I better get this up here. I've been wanting to do it. And, uh, nope, not the right chalk. This one's about, yeah, there we go. Okay, now we've got to realize that coming out of the Old Testament, everything was looking forward not to the cross, but to his kingship and the kingdom. In fact, it's been even made more vivid to me. We've been teaching in uh, one of our classes here in Oklahoma, the book of Isaiah. And of course, Isaiah is a book of prophecy. And I've been uh, stressing, some of you in here are in that class, how that all through those Old Testament prophets, it was, I will, I will, thus saith the Lord, I will. Well, I've put it this way. Those were all promises, but the promises were all what? prophecy. And so over and over throughout the Old Testament was this constant promising a prophesied king and kingdom for the nation of Israel, an earthly kingdom. And we've been looking at all the references that make it so plain that it was to be an earthly kingdom over which Christ would rule and reign from his throne room in Jerusalem. And of course, I realize that most of Christendom doesn't know what I'm talking about. But it's a biblical concept. And this, of course, is what Paul meant in uh, Romans 15, verse 8. I use it over and over and over. I told one of my class the other night, you know, I can almost start any seminar. I can almost start any Bible class with Romans 15, verse 8 and go from there. Now a lot of you are already looking it up. Okay, keep your hand in 1 John. I'm not through there. But go back and just look at Romans 15, verse 8. I don't have to look it up. I know what it says. <laughs> Romans 15, verse 8. What does Paul say? Come on, find it quickly. I say then that Jesus Christ... What's the verb? was. We covered that Saturday night, didn't we, <laughs> in fine shape. Somebody was jumping on me on my use of the verbs, and I had to show them 15.8. It is the verb was. Now, Jesus Christ was a minister of the what? Circumcision. Who's circumcision in Scripture? Israel. For Jesus Christ was a minister of Israel for the truth of God. Wasn't Paul's idea. It was all part of the eternal purposes. All right, for the truth of God, 
to confirm or fulfill the what? The promises made to whom? The fathers. Well, who are the fathers in Scripture? Israel's forefathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on up through Israel's history. So why did Jesus come? To fulfill the promises made to the nation of Israel. And what were those promises? That he would come and give them an earthly kingdom over which there would be no suffering Roman Empire, there would be no persecution, there would be no sickness, there would be no death. It would be literally heaven on earth. And he'd be the king. And then in Matthew, what did he promise the twelve? That they would sit on twelve thrones, ruling the twelve tribes of Israel. That was all part and parcel of the promises made to the fathers. See? All right. So everything is leading up to this coming of the king, but Israel could not believe it. They could not accept Jesus of Nazareth as that promised king of the kingdom, so they fulfilled the purposes of God. They crucified him. All right, God raised him from the dead, called him back to glory. We've gone through this before at the ascension. But Peter and the eleven keep right on preaching the Old Testament promises that this one whom they crucified was alive and he was ready as soon as the horrors of the seven years of Daniel's 70th week, which we call the tribulation, as soon as that tribulation had passed, what would happen? The king would yet come and bring in the kingdom. Now, when you follow that whole concept through, Peter in the early Acts, and then the little Jewish epistles of James and Peter and John and Jude and Revelation. Everything is looking at the unfolding of the tribulation, the second coming, and the kingdom. Nothing in here of the church age, nothing of calling out a body of Gentiles, which we call the church. It was all fulfilling the promises made to the fathers. And that's why these little Jewish epistles are on that same timeline. And as I pointed out when we introduced the little book of James, all of these writers had made a gentleman's agreement with Paul and Barnabas back there at the Jerusalem Council in about 51 or 52 A.D. And at that Jerusalem Council, you remember, they shook hands, they gave the right hands of fellowship, James and Peter and John, with Paul and Barnabas. And what was the agreement? That they would stay with Israel and Paul would go to the Gentiles. Well, in accord with that agreement then, these men had to write to Israel. They would have broken their agreement if they would have departed and started writing about Paul's gospel. They would have been totally remiss, but they weren't. And of course, the Holy Spirit is behind it all. And so they write in perfect accord with the Jewish economy, which is the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, the promised King. All right. Unknown to all of these Jewish men and prophets and everything else, it would be interrupted. Jesus knew it, and I haven't got time in just one half hour, but Jesus makes it so plain in Luke chapter 4, where he reads from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and in verse 2, he stops right in the middle, which took him to the end of his earthly ministry. The next half of the verse dealt with the coming tribulation, and the next verse dealt with the coming kingdom. But he didn't touch that far. He stopped in the middle. And at the consternation of those Jews in the synagogue, he stood up the second time and he said, This has been fulfilled in your ears. That which went to the end of his first advent. The rest was pushed out into the future. All right, then, of course, unknown to these Jewish writers, 
we have the salvation of that other little Jew who became the apostle of the Gentiles. All right, but before we look at that, let's look at the verse here in John again. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 4, just verse 1. Jerry's got on the board, so we're going to start from that, and then we'll kick off. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Same as we've seen before. Just a repetition of everything that James has said, what Peter has said, and what John has been saying in this little epistle. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Period. Now do I have to remind you again what's not in there? What's not in there? Not a word about the cross. Not a word about his resurrection. The whole concept is that if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're born of God. That won't happen today because that's not the gospel. All right, now let's go back and let's look at the gospel for today. Come back with me to Romans. Now, I've got so many verses now, I don't even know where to go first. But let's start at chapter 2, honey. You know, it's amazing what God uses. We got a letter the other day where almost a whole family who, if I understood their letter correctly, really had no spiritual interest. But the lady of the house happened to hear me call her honey. <laughs> Just happened to hear me call her honey. And she thought, if a man was good enough to call his wife honey, he's worth listening to for a minute or two. <laughs> so she listened, and she got hooked. And because of her, a whole family, husband, daughters, sons-in-laws, came to a knowledge of salvation. So you see, you just never know what God uses. It's amazing. All right, so Romans chapter 2, drop down to verse 16. Now, you realize that there are a lot of people across Christendom who won't give Paul the time of day. They almost forbid their people to even read him. I've had people tell me that their Sunday school teacher or their preacher said it should be not just taken out of the Bible. Paul shouldn't even be in here. Well, I got news for them. If they're going to depend on that which John is writing, and if they're going to depend on what Peter said, they're doomed. They've had it. And here's the reason. Romans 2.16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, that is, the heart, by Jesus Christ, who will be the judge. What are they going to be judged by? What have they done with what? Paul's gospel. Now read it again. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Why the pronoun? To set it apart from the kingdom gospel. Then that's where people stumble. Two gospels? Well, for a little while, of course. Not now. Not now. There's only one. Of course there is. But while God was still dealing with Israel before he dropped the gate, as I've been putting it lately, on the kingdom economy, and they had to go Paul's way or be lost with the rest of the world, now it's one gospel, Paul's gospel. All right, what is Paul's gospel? Come over with me to Romans 16, verse 25. Romans 16, verse 25. All got it? Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Not Peter's, not Jesus, Paul's gospel. According to my gospel, and what is Paul's gospel? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret 
since the ages began. Now, you see, this is why Peter, James, and John couldn't preach it. It had been kept secret. It wasn't time to reveal that to Peter, James, and John. It had to wait until this apostle was brought on the scene, and now to this man is given that finished work of the cross. All right, now just turn on into 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to see the vast difference in the language. There's no more addressing the nation of Israel, but more than that, he's going to address the Gentiles. Although certainly the Jews are welcome to come into this great glorious salvation, but primarily it's going to be the age of the Gentile. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He's writing to a Gentile congregation down there in Corinth in southern Greece. So he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize like he did John the Baptist, but he sent Paul not to baptize, but to what? Preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross, here it comes, see? Lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the preaching of the cross, that's Paul's gospel. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is the what? The power of God. All right, then he comes all the way down to verse 23. We preach Christ, what? Crucified. Not the king of Israel. Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks foolishness. And isn't that the way the world looks at it today? My, I was just reading an article on Europe again last night. Do you know that Europe is almost 99.9% .9 secular? This particular writer said the only thing, the only role the churches in Europe play are tourist attractions. Nobody goes to church. Nobody has any spiritual insight. Now I've got to qualify that. There's always a few. But government, you know, their new constitution that they've put together, not one mention of God, not one mention of anything spiritual. It is totally secular. Is it any wonder they hate our president? He makes them feel guilty just by his presence. I know he does. But listen, this is the world tonight. They think the preaching of the cross is so much foolishness. But that's Paul's gospel. All right, now let me take you to another one. Romans. Romans. Chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, dropping in at verse 23, the very first step of God's saving grace is for us to understand that we need the gospel. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that again, that's the Word of God, and we're to believe it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but it doesn't stop there. Next verse. Being justified freely by His, what? Grace. That's one of Paul's favorite words. It's the grace of God that has now been poured out on Christ rejecting mankind. All right, so we're justified freely by His grace being uh, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, that process of paying our sin debt. The Christ Jesus whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Now, I've got to stop right there. 
Once in a while, we'll get a letter from someone who says, well, you make too much of Paul. You make a sound as though he's the one who died for us. Never, never. All I maintain is that Paul is the apostle to whom this gospel was revealed. You don't worship Paul. You worship the Christ that Paul presents. All right, and here it is. I think Paul even told the Corinthians, Paul didn't die for you. Christ did. All right, so now read on in verse 25. It's through faith in the blood of Christ to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past and through the forbearance or the goodness and patience of God. Now verse 26, this is Pauline. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he, God, might be just. See, God never cuts corners. God never compromises. But he's just. He's fair. And consequently, he'll be the justifier of him who, what? Believeth. That's as simple as you can get it. No repentance, no baptism, no works, no nothing. You believe it. That's faith. You take God at his word. See? All right. Where is boasting, verse 27? Well, it's excluded. That doesn't enter in. By what law? The law of works? No. The law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified, made right with God, declared righteous, his sins forgiven, he's received eternal life, he's now fit for glory, by what? Faith, and without the deeds of the law. All right, move on. Chapter 5. Oh, my goodness. Verse 5. Romans five, 4. I'm sorry. Romans 4, verse 5. This is Paul. This is the message of grace. Nothing to do with Israel and the promises. This has all to do with the eternal purposes of God. Verse 5, but to him that worketh not. That means exactly what it says. But instead of trying to work, work and do and do, it's to him that believeth. On him who justifies the ungodly. Consequently, his faith is counted for righteousness by believing. All right, now come into chapter 5, verse 1, honey. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith. Well, faith in what? Jesus Christ and that finished work of the cross where he died for us and was buried and rose from the dead, therefore being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. Now, you see, Romans 8 makes it plain as day. The unbeliever is a what? He's an enemy. Now, as long as you're an enemy, you can't be at peace, whether it's in a human relationship or whether it's between yourself and God. If you're an enemy, there's no peace. But you see, we're no longer an enemy. By faith, we've been justified, and we're no longer an enemy. We're a child, and consequently, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Paul, all right? Now then, let's come on a little further. Chapter 7. Now Paul tells us how to walk in this Christian life. Since we don't have the law telling us every jot and tittle of what to do and what not to do, that's been crucified so far as we're concerned. And we've been crucified it, but that doesn't leave us with license. And here we come now, Romans 7. Dropping in at verse 5 and 6. 
Now Paul writes, when we were in the flesh, before we were saved, when we were in the flesh, the motions or the acts of sins which were by the law, in other words, all the things that the law designated, and they were part and parcel of things that we as lost people were doing, breaking the law, all right, they worked in our members to bring forth, forth fruit unto death, which will pop up for the unbeliever at the great white throne. Verse 6, but now, see, that's the difference. But now, as a believer, we are delivered from the law, being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. Now, remember we covered that a program or two back, how that Paul says, that we are now indwelt by the Spirit of God, our body is its temple. All right, same reference. That now we are serving in newness of Spirit who is indwelling us and He's controlling us. And we're not in the oldness of the letter, we're not under the law. All right, back up into chapter 6. That just remind me of verse 14, honey. Romans 6, verse 14. The last half of the verse. You're not under the law. You're under what? Grace. See, we're not under the heavy hand of the Ten Commandments or any of the rest of the law. That has all been done away with so that God can deal with us in grace. See? All right, now then I guess I better for the sake of time that's left, a little bit that's left, come back with me again to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where we were in an earlier program. But this is the gospel by which we have to have salvation today. And this is it alone. Granted that this Jesus, this Christ, was the Son of God. Paul refers to it over and over, how that he's the Son of God. But that alone is not enough. Here it comes now, we've got to do it quickly. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and which you have received, and wherein you stand, by which you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you have believed in vain. Now here is the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. And we're told to believe it, and when we believe it, we have all the promises of God. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.